and thank you for coming. Um, I left those eight foot snow banks that you've seen on the news. They're at my house. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be looking out at this scenic. Even the grass is exciting to me. Um, the big secret is that now I'm not, see, you've ruined it for me because I'm not from Nova Scotia, so I'll always be f from away even though I've been there 20 years. But now apparently, because I'm from BC, now I'm also not really from here either, so oh no. <laughs> um, and my st I started a small farm-based company in 1992. I sold that business in 2013, so I'd had it for just over 20 years. But I got my start in farmer's markets at the Kamloops Farmer's Market. So that's my other little... Well, there you go. Great. So I was a vendor there in 1995 <laughs> for one season before I moved out east. So, um, so yes, welcome to this session on how to be an awesome board member. And um, what I wanted to do just to start the day was to already say thank you. And why do I say that? Well, because I know very well that some of the most frustrating complicated work that you do in the world is being on a farmer's market board. Boards governance in the farmer's market sector isn't an easy thing to do and your commitment, your everybody goes there with the best of intentions and many people aren't having great experiences on their boards and so I just want to thank you for your commitment to doing that work and for showing up at things like this to figure out how can I make it better for me and how can I make it better for my board. So my hat's off to you for being here in the first place. Um, I am gonna have this PowerPoint sort of running in the background. I have handouts, we've put together a little kit. BCAFM was, hap was kind enough to print all of these for you. This is the longer PowerPoint, so there isn't a copy of this, but I'm happy to email it to anybody after the fact if you want it, so you don't necessarily have to take notes off this. We have a fl few flip charts we'll use. You can take notes from that. This is essentially what we'll do today. I'm gonna introduce myself a little bit, have you introduce yourselves to each other in the room. We're gonna do an assessment to look at where are you right now? What's working on your board? What isn't working on your board? Where are, your, where are you seeing your strengths and weaknesses and, the, and your board strengths and weaknesses? We're gonna look at what I call the dry stuff. This isn't a long piece, just some of the, what does it mean legally to be sitting on a board of nonprofit board in Canada? What is your fiduciary responsibilities? Those kinds of things. We're going to look at some typical farmer's market board models, three of them. Every board that I've ever run across has some variation on those three, so they, will, they aren't definitive, but um, it's a way of us looking at what is and isn't working in these models. And I have a preference, a bias, in terms of what board model we should all be moving towards. So we'll talk about that. I have a list of some do's and don'ts for you as board members. Um, we're gonna look at qualities, communication skills of great, great, I should say awesome board directors. And we'll look at this topic of leadership because of course, many of you get on the board simply to help your farmer's market, but by virtue of being on the board, you've assumed some level of leadership. And just owning that, stepping into it in some ways can be really, it can help uh, drive back some of the things that end up not working so well for you on your board. So just to quickly tell you, um, not just that I'm happy to have left all the snow drifts, um, but why am I the person who's lucky enough to be standing here today? Um, my position technically with FMNS is Director of Training. We have a wonderful relationship with the Department of Labor and Advanced Education in our province, which enables us to deliver these a six full day and eight full day manager and vendor training programs around the province. So um, they're free of charge for participants and all of Department of Labor and Advanced Education. You'll have some version of that. Every provincial government's agencies are called something different, but that's 
You do have workplace initiatives in BC, and we met last night for supper, some of the people on the board of BCAFM, and they're all over <laughs> trying to develop something similar here. Um, we also do board governance training for the farmers market sector, and what we're doing this year is actually taking farmers markets and other nonprofits and putting them together in the room, because what we find is some farmers market boards are reluctant to take their own board training. They feel like they'll be picked on or uh, what, found to be doing things wrong within the sector. So by inviting them into a room with a bunch of other organizations, we're hoping that um, people t basically, to be frank, it's to have them take their defenses, check them at the door a little bit more, and be more open to learning some of the things that are and aren't working well on their boards. Um, I'm a trainer. I ho own a company called Whole Green Heart, and I have private clients. About 40% of my clients are from the farmer's market sector because that's the business that I ran for many years as I was doing project management and consulting. As I had one of, uh, it became a very well-known Nova Scotia farm-based herbal products company, and that's what I sold at farmer's markets for 18 years. Um, and have been busy working on an online home study program, um, which is launching in May, and I have some information about some things to share with you later. So thank you very much for having me here. What I want to have you do is get to know e each other a little bit better. And so we're gonna do an exercise, and it's called what do you, or why do you care? So for the first step in this is I want you to just take out a piece of paper. There is a bit of, there are these huge pieces of paper that have just been passed out. <laughs> to take one and just answer these two questions for yourself. I'll just give you two or three minutes. So what would you say if someone said, why do you serve on your board? Why do you care enough to serve? And then secondly, what moves you? And I mean really moves you about your market and about what it's doing in the community and or for vendors. So just think about that for a second, answer those couple notes on a piece of paper and then we'll, we're gonna do a, something with that. So I have a few questions for you coming out of that. What was that like for you? And what were your colleagues saying? Things that came up over and over that you were hearing from the same people sense of community okay sense of community sure if you've gone to some business training programs or maybe board governance training programs or heard about developing an elevator speech something that we can tell people this is our role on the board and what we do and say you know what if you don't know that and you just speak to those two questions it's that why you're doing what you're doing is compelling to people that's what you need to say in in in, by way of introduction. Not what your role is, I'm a such and such on the board and we do such and such, but to say, I care about this, I'm, I'm passionate about what our market's doing. Uh, he was saying that this is, these are great questions to ask when you're doing succession planning and looking for new people. And part of what we'll do this morning is look, I have this idea that all boards should be developing these director information packages for prospective new board members. And it isn't simply the dry legal policies and procedures of your market, but some of this chance to self-reflect about what they're bringing to the table and what their organization's doing. And when you ask people these kinds of questions and say, this is what our board's really about, it lets them make sure it's a good fit. We We're gonna move into the, what I call the dry, you can just maybe collect them and stick them on the table and get them back, I'll collect them at the end. Uh, what I called the dry stuff at the beginning, we're just going to run through some of your legal obligatory duties as board members. Corporate, corporate uh, governance is very different from nonprofit governments. Governance, how it's interpreted under common law in Canada is different. So all of the information I'm presenting today is basically from the nonprofit sector. Some of you might be incorporated as for-profit co-ops. Some of you, there may be a few farmers markets that are run as corporate businesses. I'm not sure how you're organized in this room. So I just wanted to tell you this is the bent from which this information comes. 
it's important for you to know that whether or not you're incorporated, whether you're a big or a small organization, common law doesn't really differentiate. You have the same rules and obligations and duties as board directors, whether you're incorporated or not, whether you're large or small. So don't think that, oh, well, we just have an informal uh, market, something went wrong, uh, we won't be found liable in the same way a big corporation would. That isn't how uh, common law is, is uh, structured in Canada. So I don't want the risks and obligations to hold you back as a board, but I think it's important that you don't take them lightly. And so that's why we're just going to run through some of these quickly here. Um, one of the, maybe I'll stand here, seems better. <laughs> Fiduciary duty um, is the most common mistake that directors on farmers market boards are making. Um, you have three primary duties. Fiduciary duty is often known as the duty of loyalty. But what it says is that if you are on a board of directors, you have to be representing the best interests of the organization itself, even if they are in conflict of your own self-interest. So for example, what happens on our boards is we say, well, I'm there representing the primary producers. I'm there representing the artisans. I'm there representing the bakers. And so I'm only going to vote and make decisions that support the interests of that sector because that's my role on the board. And that's not right. You can't do that. That goes against this fiduciary duty, which is you have to represent the best interests of the whole organization at all times. So it can be helpful to bring your perspective, whatever hat you wear as a vendor. But even if the... Um, even if something happens or a decision has to be made on your board that doesn't support your best interests, you're obligated to vote based on what is best for the whole market. And I, I remind people, I had a business at the farmer's market sector for 18 years. I was a board member on um, several big growing markets in Nova Scotia. Do you think that there was never a time that we had to make a decision that wasn't in my business's best interest? And the answer is, of course. In growing this sector and professionalizing our markets, moving from seasonal to full year-round markets, moving from outdoor markets into permanent facilities, there were decisions about times of day, there were decisions about where vendors will be located that didn't always feel like they were my best interest. But that was not my job. My job was to support decisions and be part of decision-making processes that supported the growth of my market. And that's this. When we do manager training, we spend 40 hours looking at these topics. Because these are, they're specific to your market. A market here that's a Farm market, farmers markets only. There was, I was just talking to somebody who has an artisan market one day or they're going to in a farmers market the other day and never the twain shall meet. Very different than a market that's in a, what? A small town looking for more vendors, um, doesn't have much selection. The decisions they make about product mix and vendor mix will be very different. You just have to, as a market, be, what is your mission and mandate? What are our policies and procedures that are going to support that? But I will say, protectionism runs rampant on our boards. <coughs> Vendors are entrenched. Vendors don't want things to grow. They don't want things to grow in ways that they feel is in com competition with what they're selling. And it's wrong. <laughs> it holds back markets. Well, I'll be frank about that. Um, atmosphere as well. Eight mm -hmm. potters at a market with 25 vendors is too many potters. Mm -hmm. But you can alternate them. But you, well, you can alternate them. But the other th truth is you could give me a slab of clay and some paints and you and you and you. And we'd all show up at the market with different product. And more importantly, each of us, it's not what we're selling right? It's never about the pottery. It's who we are, what is our story, what, what do people want when they buy the pottery from me? So there's always this balancing of how, are, how do we protect and make sure that we don't oversaturate the market in terms of certain products, but also recognizing more choice brings more customers. 
and that we can, you can have two bakers, you could give them the same recipe, the same flour, and they'll still show up to the market with two different products and they will appeal to different kinds of customers. So we have to be careful about the assumptions we make about what is too much. These are complicated issues that you have to work out at your board level. And I don't want to get bogged down in this, but I'm, I'm happy you raised it. Mary, a quick yeah, comment. Well, I, I do I want us to move on. Is I know of one market that they're not wanting to recognize mm -hmm. that request. because So they're, that is exactly right. an example of this. I mean, it, and there's no right or wrong answer to this, but the board needs to know that they need to be looking at, at that issue of when are we open from the perspective of what's good for our organization as a whole, not from the perspective of what's good for the produce vendors or that person's been there, they won't keep coming and they're one of our ringers. And <laughs> I need us to keep moving on, okay? We'll have time for uh, conversations as we continue, but I wanna get through this. So this is this first one. These are the three major duties that you have as a board of director, a nonprofit board in Canada. This fiduciary or duty of loyalty. And remember, even if you personally don't agree with the decision and you might not have voted against it, your job then is to support that. You're going against this if you are the person who says, we voted for our hours to be changed from eight to two and I don't agree with it. You need to step off the board if you want to go into your community and not be supporting the decisions of the board. Duty of, and, and you can be held liable for being a director of a board if you're out in the community not supporting the decisions that are made at the board level. You also have a duty of diligence, I'll just read very briefly, it's the duty to act reasonably, prudently, in good faith, and with a view to the best interests of the organization and its members. And then the duty of obedience, these are very conservative sounding <laughs> words, I know. Some of you in the room don't like these. This is just how it's set up in our legal language. So the duty of obedience is to act within the scope of the governing policies of the organization and within the scope of other laws, rules, and regulations that apply to the organization. So for example, one of them is um, there's regulations in terms of reporting. You as a board have to have a binder where you keep a copy of all your minutes. It's your official minutes binder. And that's one of your responsibilities as a board that would fall under this. Another is, um, I don't know if you do this, but we have a, our, if we do 50-50s at farmer's markets in Nova Scotia, the department, I think it's service, service Nova Scotia hands out the, uh, uh, permits for those and one of the requirements that they have at the end of the year when you send in the money their portion of the money is that you have to say what the name phone number address is of each person who won that money but many 50 50s they're not collecting that information you're obligated to under this duty and then so basically liability is the failure <coughs> to fulfill any of these that's a very simple understanding of liability and so then I just, you know, one of the things we talk about is risk management from a liability perspective on a board. What does that mean? Mostly if you know your organization and its policies, bylaws, rules, and regulations well, it keeps you out of trouble because then you almost by default will be uh, in compliance with your three duties. So really important to know your organization's policies and many of you don't and it's not a fault of anybody. We don't as a sector expect these kinds of things of ourselves and we probably need to just to keep, um, keep practicing best practices and show other board members what it means to be an awesome board member because that's what this is all about. So then risk management, basically you could break it down. It's to anticipate risk or harm, take practical measures to mitigate or minimize risk, and then if it does, to assume risk, meaning you own up to it, and then you try to minimize damage. So these are some of the common areas of risk that farmers markets face. So training staff and volunteers, facilities and equipment. So the number one insurance claim ever against farmers markets in North America is tents blowing, tents blowing over and hitting people, product, and vehicles. In fact, at a market that I was at, a tent blow over and 
Two vehicles were heavily damaged. My Honda Fit was one of them. And just the scratches from the feet of a tent did over $1,200 in damage. So there's um, market day of, obviously. Lots of room for risk possibilities there. And then documentation of meetings and processes, those reporting requirements. They're also things that we're not necessarily looking after well and need to. Do they have to be in order? Um, no, they just need to be there. Oh, okay. It's better to put the early ones on top, but <laughs> if you don't have it and need to pull together what you have just to get up to speed, just gather what you can. It's better than having nothing. So one of the um, things that comes out of this in terms of thinking about those duties of a director, risk and liability, and I mentioned this earlier this morning, is that I think every board should be developing a director's information package. It forces you as an organization to take some of this seriously and it helps make sure that the next people who are coming onto your board come for the right reasons and with the right skill set. So you ask people to think about their reasons for becoming a board member, some of those exercises that we did this morning. And, and make sure that people understand what they are required in terms of their time, their interest, their commitment to do the job well. Farmers markets are often just scrambling for board members and kind of take anybody. And my feeling is you're better to have a small board of three to five people who work really effectively than to have a board of seven or nine people that is ineffective. And it's one of the issues you could go back to your boards immediately and work on is what is the size of our board? What do we need to be an effective board? And are we making an assumption that more is better? Because often a smaller number of dedicated board members who understand governance, how to run meetings, who have the time to go to board training, make a more effective board than a board of seven or nine people where you're always just trying to get uh, names to fill places. Ask people to learn about your organization. Think about how it's perceived in your community. Make sure you share your missions, all the rules and regulations with pers pers prospective board members and ask them to read them and hold them accountable to going through. It'll take them an hour, two hours to read through all your documents. If they're not even willing to do that in advance of sitting on the board, <laughs> are they likely to be that committed as board members? provide written job descriptions. And if we have time today, I have an exercise about that. If we don't get to it, um, my suggestion for what you do with that is this is a sample board job description that I gave you. This Andy Robinson, it's from one of his books. He's a great board trainer. So it's the reason I introduced him, his work to you, just so you'd have his name. But you would take this document and rewrite it for your board. So if we don't have time to do that today, which I'm not sure we will, please take this and consider revamping this job description for your next board members um, based on your market and its values. And then I had a few other ideas for this. Discussion papers like this. This is from Volunteer Canada, That little, those two sections I read about your duties. Things like Volunteer Canada are great places to get these discussion papers on what your legal duties are. All of you could maybe, maybe one of the things I can send is a link to this and a couple of other great documents just for you to feel like you've got some uh, information on hand about your legal obligations. Share information about the other board members and, and ask people to assess fit. Some, some of the board troubles we get into, let's be honest, are personality issues. And we're going to talk about that too today, but um, fit is a legitimate question to be asking. And I wouldn't sit on a board that didn't have insurance, and, and I don't want you to either. And if you don't have it, you should get it. <laughs> it's more expensive than vendor insurance. Some, small market struggle to find the money for that, but you, you really do need it. So that's an example of a document, a process that you as a, board, uh, you as a market may say, oh my gosh, we have no time for this. We're busy trying to promote our market and find vendors. And you get bogged down so often in just the minutia of day of market. And some of these important steps get left to the back burner. But I'll tell you, to be an awesome board member, it's to be paying attention to this kind of the back of the scenes thing. You're, and we'll get into what you should be doing at your board level. Um, well, let's, I guess we'll just move there now. 
Remember I said at the beginning, I'm gonna present three models for the kinds of boards that are common at farmer's markets in Canada. None of you will say, oh, we're exactly this. Some of you, well, some of you may. But most of the time, there's some version of this happening. And I'm just gonna present what are some strengths and weaknesses of these models. This is where markets tend to get to with age and market size. Large markets and markets that have been around for a long time tend to have these manager and staff on one side handling operations and policy boards on the other, neither, neither the twain shall meet, and that's ideal. This is where you want to be headed, and I know this already feels threatening to some of you, but just hear, hear this out. Um, one of the, I'm not sure if this is on another slide, research um, shows that there's a number of factors that are associated with failure of farmers markets, and some of them are small size, low paid or volunteer managers, or managers who don't get enough support from their boards. So as soon as you can get your market to the place where you have a sta some stable revenue streams and you're hiring managers to do all the operations and you as a board are strictly focused on policy, that builds sustainability. So let's look at number one. This is where you have no staff and you have a working board. Now there's no such thing actually as a working board and I just want to clarify that. Boards of directors are policy organizations. If some of you are there and you're also doing volunteer jobs for your board, you shouldn't actually be doing that as board work. You put down the policy work, you take off your board hat and then you sit around the same table and now you're just volunteers working for the market. You're not, there's no such thing as a board that handles operations. Boards are of, by nature, policy organizations. So most farmers markets in Canada started in this way. It was just groups of vendors who got together and they realized, ooh, there's some administrative organizing to do. We'll take care of that in order to have markets. And still many markets start this way, but it's not the only way. Smart markets are starting with more uh, the way corporations do basically is they have policy boards right from the beginning and they have executive directors or staff who are handling operations right from the beginning. The problem with this is what? It tends to entrench self-interest. These boards that are dominated with long-term vendors who are there representing their best interests, these are the most common to have happen on these kinds of boards. And remember that the board who starts a market tends to set a very powerful pr precedent for what happens next in the market's history. It's hard to change precedents once they've been put in place. I see so many nods around the table. So this is one of the reasons why you really have to say if you have a new or emerging market or your market looking to go to another day of the week, are there ways that we can structure our operations versus policy different? Um, Ah, these boards also tend to be coming from that sense that, well, if we don't pay people and we do the volunteer work, there's just more money for the vendors. We can keep our fees lower. And we talked about this over supper last night is that, and we talk about this a lot in vendor and manager training is those are just mindsets that people get in. If you don't think you can pay, you can pay 25, but not 35 for table fees. But if $10 a week, is really what you're hanging the success of your business on, then you're not operating from a business mindset. You're operating from a hobbyist, somebody who's trying to eke by and make a living. And you can't form strong organizations with people who have, who have that very small, small and lack of trust in their ability to grow if they put money into fundraising and having staff who handles operations so that they as board can handle the board side of things. Board burnout and bad feelings are very common in these kinds of boards. Certain people t tend to do almost everything. We've heard some of this here today. Other people can often feel controlled. Like, so th it, this can be the same person or two other people. Two people. You can have people on the board who do everything f sort of from a m martyr I'll do it, nobody else wants to. Or there can be very forceful personalities who've just become entrenched and they stay there and they, they're just asking other people to rubber stamp their decisions. 
So there's lots of things to go that can go wrong with those kinds of boards. Let's see what else I have to say. So to mitigate some of those problems, if this is your situation, you need to clarify when you're actually working as a board and when you're simply volunteering. When you have a board meeting, you're dealing with policies, you're dealing with bylaws, you're dealing with strategic thinking about where you want your market to be headed. Then you adjourn the meeting. Then you say, okay, what about our Facebook page? What about the event that's happening for the first day that the school is let out? Those kind of day of market operational things, you can work on together, but you're not, as, at that po point in time, you're not a board. You're just volunteers working together on operational issues. And, and I think it's very, people, ah, oh, there's a light bulb that goes off. Be because then what you can start seeing is that that policy work is what you need to continue to do and that volunteer work, the operational, the promotion, the administration, collecting of fees, those are things that slowly over time you can start shifting to staff people. So start just getting clear in your mind what, what's what. what. So let's get to that model because we're headed there. Um, this simple shift, this simple shift makes all the difference. Board is policy, decision, governance time. The rest of the time you're not an operational board. There's no such thing as that. You're just volunteers. Um, and the other thing is there are many people at your market, vendors, who are interested in helping grow the market, but they're terrible candidates for a board. They don't like meetings. They don't like following procedures. They don't like reading through volumes of material about bylaws. Well, what we do is we tend to just stick them on the board because we think that's where our vendor volunteers should go. No, not at all. Your policy board of directors, five people who do like that kind of thing and have the rest of them simply doing this volunteer work, not under the auspices of being board members. Now, the, uh, another common model is that you have a part-time staff person with this working board. Now, many of you call this part-time staff person a manager, but I'm here to tell you, if, if, you are being, if you're working under the direction of a board who's got their hands on the policy side but is also supposedly helping you <laughs> do uh, operational things, then that person is a coordinator. Because managers, there's definitions for what is a manager and what is a coordinator. Coordinators are people who, who's, we're getting to this PowerPoint, maybe I should have put it in a different order, but coordinators take their work plans from other people who've decided what they're going to do and they simply implement it. Somebody who's in a manager position determines their own work plans. They take the budget and the and the bylaws and policies of the organization and they decide what is in the best interest of the organization and I'm going to go do it. And they're empowered by their board to make those decisions. So, so you don't, most of the time when you have these working boards, you don't really have a manager because you're micro, you're, you're, you as a board are very involved with deciding what the manager should and shouldn't be doing. So those are coordinators. A coordinator, <laughs> the definition of a coordinator is that they don't have decision-making power, managers do. And all your staff would be working under your manager. I'm just going to, I'm going to ask for the questions to wait till we finish this section because I feel like what's coming up are questions that are going to be answered when we get through this. Um, I think this is even harder to make work because you have this person who's in the middle of uh, a board that isn't really clearly understanding its policy role. Um, and so th those people feel very micromanaged under these models. There's a lot of staff turnover. Retention rates are very low. Lots can be getting done, but a lack of clarity about who should be doing what means it's kind of a chaotic thing. Like people are running around on market day and board meetings are rushed. and. <coughs> You know, there's not very many farmers markets under this model where the people involved with running the markets would say, things are good, they're going well, we find this work easy. No, it's always we're dealing with one crisis after the next after the next. Sustainability is a big challenge for these markets when they get to this place because often what happens 
is that they hire coordinators, call the managers, and then their main job is day of market stuff. Collect fees, make sure people's tables are set up, um, run the events booth, make sure the nonprofit organizations are in the right place. The first thing you should be hiring is people to do admin work, planning work, strategy work within your organization. Those, the day of tasks are the thing that you as a working board, if you want to continue working and doing helpful work for your organization, do more of that day of work and hire somebody with some promotions, marketing, admin, financial skills to help your organization build that set of office skills that need to be handled. And we tend to do it the other way. Markets that get unstuck but use this model actually are focused on not hiring people just for day of, but hiring people with skills um, in terms of marketing and promotion, fundraising, that kind of thing. It's also in this model, what happens is that you hire somebody and all we're gonna, we're get, we have all these jobs that need to be done, but I'm only comfortable giving you this little piece. And we're going to make sure that you're working on that the way we want you to work at. There are so many skilled, passionate people who can be brought into coordinator or manager positions, but they don't stay, not for lack of skill, but for a lack of support and for lack of saying, what we'd like is a suite of four events. You might even get to, we want one event in these months, or we want an event that features these products, but you need to then let people go do it. You can't say, so what you're going to do is you're going to work with board member so-and-so. <laughs> Those volunteers working with the staff, that model tends to not work very well. So what can you do? Clarify rules, who's the board? If you have boards, the minute you've hired somebody, the board members are actually working under them. The board members don't like that, and so what they tend to do is they, they tend to say, well, you report to us as a board. And it's not true. Staff are, report their report to the board as an entire entity, but if you as a board, the five of you have hired me, I'm not accountable to you or to you or to you as individuals or as vendors. I'm only accountable to you as a group. So if you say, okay, we've only hired me for 20 hours a week. I'm responsible for doing, um, I keep using events as an example. Let's say a fundraising dinner instead. We're gonna have a big harvest feast and you and you wanna work with me to, to build that event and find a sponsor and do some fundraising. In that situation, you are actually under me because you're volunteers and I'm the organization staff. But those rules are always confused and it's why these models tend to be tricky. So an answer is to clarify. And then you do want the, the coordinator to have somebody that um, is their go-to person on market day, not that I'm re reporting to them, but you need to, whether you have a coordinator or a manager, you need somebody on the board that can just be their sounding voice. So clarify who that person is, and it's not a reporting to, but it's like a point person for market day. It can be very helpful. And remember, okay, so in Nova Scotia, the model that we promote for our markets is that they'd be looking at 50% of their funding coming from vendor fees and 50% of their funding come from other sources and we work hard to train managers around the province on how to do fundraising, how to get sponsorships, how to run events that don't take from your budget but actually add money to your budget because we don't want to see markets that are held back in terms of their ability to hire staff because vendor fees would have to go up so disproportionately high. So looking at always at how do you make sure that fundraising is a focus of your board and a focus of what you're hiring staff with competencies to do fundraising so that they can have positions, hours to do the operations side and you as a board can get on with the work of the policy side of things. 
So this is the third scenario and the better scenario. You want to head towards this model where you have part-time or a full-time manager and a policy board. Let's quickly, I'm going to skip through right now, we'll come back. So the difference between a manager and coordinator is basically who sets the, who makes decisions and who sets work plans. Coordinators don't do that. They work under a board. The board has projects and budgets and work plans that they set and decide upon and then they just have a coordinator who, who um, operationalizes that. They're quite limited in their decision making and in their autonomy. Managers, they still work under the board, but they develop work plans. They work within an approved budget to say, okay, I think this is the way we should head with our fundraising. This is where we should head with events. This is where we should head with our volunteer program. This is where we should head with uh, vendor fees even. Man skilled managers working with policy boards often make uh, advise boards about where uh, vendor fees should be set. And so they do have autonomy to handle operations and day of management of the market. And I don't know if I have another, no I don't. So then back to this third kind of board then. This is the least fuzzy. Operations are handled by a manager and policy is handled by the board. Um, And this is where you can get boards that are very strong on policy and really know how to run meetings, clear, follow governance models well, because they're not thinking day of market fundraising volunteers. They're thinking policy. That's their job. That's what they get good at. That's their focus. And then managers often in those cases use groups of volunteers amongst the vendorship to help them with other activities. It doesn't mean vendors aren't active as volunteers, but they're being organized by the manager, not by the board itself. I'll also tell you because we run a 40 and now 60 hour manager training program every year. We have the same managers who come year after year to that training. 60 hours means eight full days of training that they take throughout a year. And why do they keep coming back? Partly because of the skills that they're learning. Partly because of this community of peers, of like-minded managers. And partly because um, our organizations as a whole in our province are kind of understanding the same best practices. So right now I think one of the struggles I see in Ontario, because I'm doing training in Ontario too, is when you have bigger provinces and you have markets all over, there isn't a sense of, ah, we share this as a model, we share this as a model, everybody's doing things differently. And I think BCA, FM, as they start implementing some of their own training, it's going to be so helpful for all of you to feel like, ah, we can have some bigger umbrellas of best practices that we can fall under. We don't have to be reinventing the wheel ourselves. Is it pressing, Ted? No, I can do Okay. And always, always, always to have this fundraising function as one of the, the, the things that you're hiring people for. And in fact, we've had some smaller markets in Nova Scotia start up. And what they do is structure the contract that they pay a minimum of 10 hours a week at a certain rate, wage. And they give the manager 40% of all revenue that they generate. So there's an actual incentive built in. The board isn't on the hook for hours that they can't pay for. The staff are empowered to go out and raise money for their market in order to have more hours and salary for themselves. So there's innovative ways that you can think about how can we structure a job to get in somebody who has the broad skill set that it takes but, but to minimize risk for our board in terms of what we can commit to right now. <laughs> So I, I've created some do's and don'ts for you. One of my favorite, um, one of the documents I'll send you, I don't think I brought it, it's called Boards Matter. And the subtitle is Board Best Practices for Busy Social Justice Executives. So we're in the nonprofit <coughs> sector doing what can be called social economy work. 
anything in that document that says executive director obviously would be market manager but there's some great tips in that and they do a neat do's and don'ts chart so um, when I started doing these do's and don'ts for in, during my trainings, people really like them. So this is the do's and don'ts for you. <clears throat> so do concern yourself with the, whether your market's achieving its mission and goals, maintaining high standards, complying with policy, remaining fresh, creative, innovative. That's your job. And remember, I'm gonna send you these slides if you want to. Don't micromanage or get caught in the operational details. Now I have a little star. Some of you are still operating with boards that are doing the operational side. So in that case, it's just to clarify, we're doing that as volunteers. That isn't actually board work. This is our work as a board. Don't direct staff on market day. Don't mistake your job as one of managing the details of running the market. That's the operational side and is either handled by volunteers or it's handled by a manager, but it's not handled by a board. Um, and when you do have a coordinator or a manager, make sure that they're involved. So we talked about this earlier. Somebody mentioned that you can have policies, but if they're hard to operationalize. Um, so let's give an example of parking. Let's say you have limited parking, so vendors unload, and then they have to go park off site. And so you say in your policies, we're gonna charge everybody $15 when they're not in compliance with our parking rules. That can be great, but if, you don't, if you're not asking people to put down their license plate, how, how is a manager supposed to actually do anything about that? So if you have a policy, and so maybe that's your parking policy, you have to figure out how are you gonna implement that, and the person who's gonna be responsible for that is your staff person or a certain volunteer, then involve them in that discussion so you can make sure you come up with an implementation plan that they can actually follow through on. Otherwise, what do you have? You have policies, and then you have what actually happens on market day because you don't have ways of making your policies actually things that you can follow through on. Don't focus on the operational side of it when it's been left up to staff. And remember, if it can be done more than one way, you have to get, let your staff be the people who decide how it can be done. That's their job. You might not like it, you might disagree with it, but you've hired people to do a job. If the job is to run an event or the job is to do record keeping for your market, um, if there's two ways to do it, they need to be left to do it their way. I know, very hard to hear. <laughs> You'll end up with great people on your staffing team if they're given that autonomy. Raise hard issues, ask penetrating questions, press for the rationale behind your plans. State your opinion, but then you have to support the majority's de decision once it's made. And we talked about that under fiduciary responsibilities. You can be there, you can passionately plea for your perspective. But once the decision's been made, then you passionately uphold the decision because that's your job as an awesome board member. Don't avoid conflict in the boardroom by sharing your disagreements only with the people who think like you do. At the same time, don't rehash those issues over and over again at the board level. If decisions have been made and the board needs to move on, you need to let them move on. Remember that the market manager doesn't report to individuals. They are accountable to the board as a whole. They do need a single point person to talk to, but that's about a, a point person. That isn't about accountability or reporting. Don't forget that when you as a board member are volunteering, you do so under the direction of the manager. You want to find time to do market manager evaluations. We've developed a tool, um, I developed it for FMNS and it's our standard market manager uh, evaluation tool. And we have one for staff and one for managers and it's a process of asking questions and we uh, in, encourage markets to let the staff person fill in a version and then to have three people on the board fill in the same evaluation and then come together and talk about the results. So um, <clears throat> that's another document I'm happy to share with anybody who emails, and emails me and said, can we have that market manager evaluation document? 
market manager turnover is another whole issue. But I will say that lack of support and feeling like their board don't support them and don't recognize their contributions is a big complaint that managers are having in that other room or wherever they are. Um, even if you think they're not, they, they're doing things differently than you would have done them, you need to find time to think on an ongoing basis your staff because they're really working in isolation and not getting the appreciation they feel they need. And um, remember, appropriate boardroom settings or through an evaluation process is, is how you deal with um, complaints that you have about how your manager is working. Attend board meetings. If they're not valuable uses of your time, let the chair know. I actually have some suggestions coming up in a minute for how you can actively be asking um, interesting questions at a board level meeting to make the most of your meetings. By board committee, that can be a nominating committee, it can be a, one of your financial committees, um, or an important area where your market could use your help as a volunteer. Ah, you have a financial background. Uh, maybe you could help run some numbers for the fundraiser where you're looking at doing. You're not doing that as a board member. You're doing it as a volunteer. Don't remain on the board if you're, just, if you're not going to be active. Don't agree to do things you're not prepared to follow through on. If you get to a point where you're in a board meeting and nobody will agree to step up and take on a certain responsibility, the job isn't to like force somebody to do it because they probably won't follow through. The job is to say, okay, we're, we're not seeing in this room an interest in taking this on. We're going to have to let this go unless somebody wants to, and what can we do instead? Board members and nonprofits give money. It's common that nonprofit board members work hard on fundraising and are themselves donors to their organizations. We don't see that nearly as much in the farmers market sector, but don't make sure that you're giving where you can, I guess is what I'd say. Um, the market is an organization beyond its use for you. So I often hear that markets run fundraisers like on non-market days, they'll have harvest feasts or they'll do auctions and vendors and board members don't come. And that's just wrong. You shouldn't be on the board if you're not willing to support the efforts that your board is taking to raise money and raise your profile in your community. Um, you can't ask for special favors. Staff aren't there to work for you. And don't assume people will see the value in your market if you don't. You need to be a champion and a member that other people will look up to as a mentor. <clears throat> your foremost duty is to represent the whole market. This is your fiduciary responsibility. And don't always advocate for one issue or one area of decision making. You know, there's people who can become entrenched and I'm the voice of whatever. I'm always on to you people about the policy around Ah, attendance. Do primary, does the actual owner of the business have to be there on market day or can they send staff or family members? These are, this is a common issue that markets are looking to resolve. So don't be the person who's always pushing for that. Your job is to be looking at how can you help contribute to decision making around all of these issues. Ad hoc committees come and go, let them go. Lots of markets don't need a whole bunch of standing committees. You don't need a fundraising committee. You don't need a, um, an events committee that, that is a standing committee. That means a, a committee that continues to meet over time. Ad hoc committee means you meet, get the job done that you were meant to meet, and then the, the committee no longer exists. Too many times we say, ah, oh, we should have a fundraising committee, and you just meet, and you just meet, and you just meet, and you're not really serving any useful goal. It's better to have a, st a fundraising committee if you want for a particular event. 
you know, I hope you're getting the point here that an actual board's job is specific. Policy, governance, strategic planning, looking ahead, looking at what are the trends coming up in the local food movement, how can we as a market respond to those. Day of market stuff really isn't the job of a board. And don't meet just to meet. Act as an ambassador and champion, promote it to the people and communities you interact with, listen to what's said, discussed at board meetings. Remember, the, the flip side of that is you, you don't speak as a board member, we promote this and that. If you've, uh, uh, if you've been told you're going as a board member to speak in an event or the media is coming, would you as a board member speak, then it's absolutely appropriate. But you're not speaking on behalf of your board unless you're authorized to do so. That you're just speaking as a volunteer. And board meetings are confidential. That's another rule about boards. You need to respect that confidentiality. And I really encourage boards to go through a process once a year um, of coming up with their own group agreements. And you almost have it on a flip chart or poster that the secretary brings and they put it on the table at the beginning of board meetings to remind you of the ways that you've agreed to be together. There's a confidentiality you can have on that. Terms, you need to have terms. Directors who have been on the board for 20 years, that's not a good thing. <laughs> I've been on that board for so long, I've helped the market grow from its infancy. <laughs> We've managed to... Well, no, I won't go down that path. But anyway, you, you do need to have terms so that you do have some turnover of board members over time. Don't n automatically renominate board members. You have an AGM for a reason, and that is to make sure that boards are working effectively, that you have the right people on the board. Sometimes people stay because they feel guilty or they're just trying to fill, you know, they're bums in a seat, as we say. They don't feel like they're contributing and neither do you. Some people just need an opportunity to say I'm too busy or this doesn't fit my skill set. I'd be more interested in working with the manager on um, a volunteer program than actually sitting on the board. So make sure you find ways and language of talking about those things so people can leave. And domineering members don't make for a fruitful board. You also need to be willing as a board to to say certain people aren't aren't effective on our board. Well, that's two. There are two different issues. I'm making the point. Some people are staying simply out of guilt. They'd love to go, and you need to let them go. Other people shouldn't be there, and they also need to be let go. So one of the things you can do is maybe you start having a checklist of um, roles and responsibilities of your board these uh, job descriptions that I mentioned and you actually have evaluations of board members. We have a lot that we could be learning from corporate boards and one of the things um, I, somebody recently gave me this book it's called The Imperfect Board Member and I was reading it this morning and he, he says uh, this author of this book called Tougher Boards for Tougher Times reminds us that right up to the time of their demise the boards of Enron and Nortel were composed of people with outstanding talents and credentials. He judges it as a case of individual competence and collective incompetence. And that's very true. You can have people on the board who are great people, who have a wealth of skills, but they're, they're not appropriate on a board. This is some of what I'm getting at here with small High functioning boards can be better than large boards where you have a lot of um, what dissension among board members, people who don't really understand their position, people who are digging for problems rather than looking for solutions, people who are le lean to that negativity rather than to the positivity. Those things can be very hard to deal with at a board level. Wait. 
But this, this is exactly the kind of thing you should be doing as a board. You need to be hiring or working as volunteers on the operational stuff. You as a board should be doing all of this kind of thing. Looking through your policies and bylaws, where do we have uh, director evaluations? What do we agree our directors can and can't do? And what are the processes that we're going to have in place on paper for when we feel that's failing? If you don't have that right now, you need to put those in place. That's what policy work is. And it can be dry. It isn't interesting to some people. But it is, the, it is essential to having a healthy organization. So good for you. And what's your name? David. David what? Thanks. David Haynes? Yeah. Okay. Talk to David Haynes if you need to get some information about their policies. So here's another thing that boards can develop are succession plans for your staff because often what we do is we hope, we hope to heck that they'll create their own succession plan. It often doesn't work that way. So what happens in a case where you're going to move on a manager? And it can be as simple as one of their jobs is to create living, working documents that can be transferred to the next person. Those managers, we talked about this last night, and long-term board members have so much information that they're simply holding on their laptops and in their heads, and it's not transferable that you call it intellectual property. It comes and goes with the people who come and go because you don't have processes and tools that are shared as an organization. So some of the work that we do at these manager training days is we have um, Excel spreadsheets and other software tools that we've developed that are, are, that are great tools for markets to be able to use. And many markets adapt them, sure, to their use, but they make sure that once a month, those Excel spreadsheets are being shared with the board or whoever. So all of the information of your organization belongs to everybody. What I want to say, just to go back to your comment, is it's all about, you know, I think one of the most helpful things to do is to keep talking policy board. We're a policy board. The language of working board, there is no such thing as working board. So policy board, policy board. And then just at every opportunity, start infusing your organization with the understanding, ah, when I'm working on operations, I'm simply a volunteer. I'm not on a working board. I think it's about languaging more than anything. And just that, that shift, as I said, it can make all the difference. I just need a second to reassess because we're running out of time and I need to figure out what's the most important thing to do here at the very end. I gave you a really interesting tool. It's called a behavioral tendency inventory. Now some of you hate this kind of thing. I don't want to do personal development, self-assessment, self-reflection. But today is about how to be an awesome board member and I will challenge you that self-reflection and a willingness to look inside is one of the things that makes you effective at a board level. So it's this great tool. We won't have time to do it today, but you go through, you answer your questions, follow the directions, and at the end, it will tell you whether you are a thinker, a director, a relator, or a socializer. Now you could say, ah, oh, this is social science, woo woo, I'm not really into it. But the point is, then we would go through this PowerPoint, which I've also given you the flip sheet of, of your communication skills. And you're going to see, ah, here's the traits of a thinker, the director, socializer, relator. And then what I would do is I would have you in this room put up your hand. Who are the thinkers? Who are the socializers, etc. The point is to help you understand here that people don't show up to piss you off or to get under your skin. <laughs> they, they show up because we're all different. We approach information and situations differently. And the take home from this, this bottom slide, great teams are when you get these broad groups of people together. So thinkers, they tend to be very slow and methodical. They like to read information, consider their decision, and get back to you later. And those of you who are directors hate that. You're like, let's make decisions, let's move on with it, I've got other things to do. So there can be tension and conflict there. But when you come to understand each other and say, 
you know, the val wait a minute, director, the value of having this person review our materials before we make a decision, you know that they're really good at, uh, at that. Let's give them until the next meeting or the next conference call to give us their input on it. So going through these kinds of activities as a board can be really powerful because it helps you see you, we're coming at it, we're just coming at stuff because we are the way it's, we are, not because we're bad or because we're irritating. So I want you to you know, take that home, take it to heart, think about it. I've told you what to possibly do with a job description document is to create a job description for your board members. Another thing we were going to do today and haven't had time to do is we were going to list on this flip chart a bunch of qualities that make awesome board members. And I'm going to say it's things very similar to this. People are open. People are respectful. People who are strong enough to say this is what I believe in but are willing either to be wrong, to change, or to say, in this situation, my strong voice isn't shared by the group and I'm okay with that. So then you kind of go through and look at those qualities and say, am I that? <laughs> am I open? Am I respectful? And these are other activities that are great to do with a board or to bring in an outside person and have them do on your board. What it helps you see is that it may be strong in you and weak in me, that actually makes us a very good team. Or if we're both neutral or moderate in something, uh, maybe we need to pull you in because you're actually strong on it. Neither of us are really going to excel at that. We need somebody else who does. So some of this self-reflection and looking at who are you as a board member is very helpful in building strength <coughs> in your board. Well, your ma if you have managers and staff, they should sit in on most board meetings. They would be recused. Policy, yeah, absolutely. Right. It's good to keep them involved. Right. Um, and then just recuse them whenever it's anything to do with the operations side or anything that isn't going well. Just. Letting leave the room? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in some, you know, it's nice to structure your meeting so that, okay, the last section of it, you're, we're just going to be dealing with board issues. We'd rather you not be there for that, so we'll do that later. Um, I had a great section of this presentation that I wanted to do on how to run great meetings and some tips for how to run great meetings. Um, ah, actually, oh my gosh, another, I had two other, <laughs> there's also, see, <laughs> this material would do for an entire day. If anybody does want to go to the networking, we'll keep meeting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have my top 10 tips for farmers market board leadership. You have a copy of this too, so please go through it. But I almost hate for you to take it away without hearing the text that goes with it. I don't want you to misconstrue any of this. Um, one, of the mo one of my most powerful ones that I can leave you with though is there are lots of great ideas gathering momentum in the local food movement. Is your market one of them? Is your market one of them? Because there are starting to be so many interesting ways for people to get local food. There are home delivery systems. There are CSAs that are partnering with other farms and other value-added producers to offer a whole range of stuff. There are local food stores and even restaurants and cafes with huge local food sections. Farmers markets are kind of inconvenient for people they don't tend to have as many products as you can get at a local food store. So there's some assumptions we've made as a sector about what farmers markets role is in the community. I think it's time as, you know, I think we're facing some legitimate challenges from some of these other really innovative things that are happening in local food. And I want us to uh, rise to that and just be thinking a little creatively. Um, I don't want to <laughs> give you those ideas because they'll be different for every market, but just to be asking those kinds of questions.
those would be the decisions about um, how many vendors are we going to have in what product categories. You know, one of the, a really useful tool that we came up with and lots of markets are using in Nova Scotia is that you agree as a group how many vendors in different product categories you're willing to have per 10 vendors. So as the market grows, the manager's job isn't to to assess every individual vendor, but to assess, does it fit in the formula that we've agreed on? Um, it could also be things like, um, what are we gonna do in terms of marketing and promotion? What are we gonna do with social media? And basically the board, but it's not the board, you as a group of volunteers are deciding all of that and then the coordinator's just going and implementing it versus a manager who you would say, we need a social media plan. We need an, a, a suite of events. We need a suite of events that um, maybe you even say these are the goals with the events, but then the manager turns all of that into... Uh, so this is a great point. I mean, we're, we're running late, so maybe we finish this conversation after this comment another time, but what he's sh showing is that what we think of as market manager is a day of person. And from my perspective, day of is only one little piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Marketing, promotions, fundraising, record keeping, risk management, those are jobs that are also oper on the operation side. You can have one person who does it all. Great markets can have two and three part-time staff who are doing the pieces that they're great at. The problem is you'll get better retention if you can offer full-time jobs for people. So it's often about, you know, to have skill sets for day of, which includes like lifting 50 pounds worth of stuff, all the way from people who can do, who are like social media savvy. It's hard to find all of that in one person. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope that we get to spend some time together over the next few days. <laughs>